Yeah! That was a good one. Playoff preview series starts right now. We are going to be covering every single game from this first game kicking off on Saturday, the San Francisco 49ers versus the Seattle Seahawks through the Super Bowl, which goes through the Atlanta Falcons. Animal cannot be here with us today because he's his internal guts are coming out of him at the moment. He said he's got the stomach virus. I don't know what he has, but rest in peace to Animal if we never see him on camera again. Probably the last time he ever eats chicken teriyaki. That's I feel like he says that every I feel like he gets he's one of those guys that gets like food poisoning from a food and he's fine to just continue. Never learns his it. lesson. Yeah, he had to, <laughs> that's what the first thing he said. I think I had some bad yaki last night. <laughs> That should, Hideki should be yaki. Yeah, so. <laughs> some bad Hideki. Yeah, so we're going to go through every single game. Basically, the way this series is going to work is these games that we're talking about right now are on Saturday. So we're going to come out with a, uh, this video on Friday that highlights the game for the next day. So on Saturday, these games are going to be played, and we're going to have a video dropping for Sunday's games. When there's a Monday game, we'll have a video dropping on Sunday. So we want to film two days before, have the video go out the day before the game, and then the games are obviously played. So we're going to walk through the entire preview of the games, talking weather, uh, injuries that will affect the game, just looking at the spread, the over-unders, um, you know, anything gambling, betting, fantasy-wise. We're going to be going through our favorite prize pick squares um, and, you know, just getting in deep oh, with yeah, the games. And this first one should be fun because you are a San Francisco 49ers fraud fan. Super excited for this one. It's good to be back in playoffs. Good to have a third week against Seattle. You know, Seattle's kind of unraveling. I think uh, I, the shine off Seattle is starting to rub off. This is a good way to break into the playoffs. Yeah. Better I mean, than the Packers, better than the Lions. Give me the Seahawks. Yeah, it's an interesting storyline because you guys have played twice before, which is the case for most of the teams in the first round. A lot of them, you know, they've played each other once, so we have a little bit of a sample size. And Animal actually wrote up some, some great fucking notes here. We have the 49ers swept the Seahawks during the regular season. They will be the 20th team in the wild card era to face an opponent a third time after a... What does the SU mean? Straight up. Straight up. Opponent a third time after a straight up sweep in the regular season. Those teams are 12 and 7. Straight up. 9, 9, and 1 against the spread. So that makes sense, right? If you beat them twice, you're probably the better team overall, so you have a better record third time. But still like a 2-to-1 ratio here. 9.5 point spread. 42.5 point over under. Game kicks off 4.30 p.m. Eastern time, I feel like the entire country is probably outside of Seattle in agreement that the Niners walk away from this game with a win. But it's a big spread. Are you nervous at all? Just because it's a divisional opponent, you guys have seen each other a couple times, Pete Carroll's fucking vet. I mean, maybe he's got something up his old sleeves. Like, no. There is a little, like, uh, what's mm -hmm. good? Like, a little PTSD from prior years, but this is just, it's not the same team on either side. I mean, I just don't think the Seahawks match up well against the Niners in any aspect of this game. It's, um, yeah, I mean, it's, like you said, nine and a half point favorites. I think if we were facing the Packers, it would be a shorter spread. The Lions would be a shorter spread. I'm not even sure the Seahawks are like a top 10 team in the NFC at this point. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of, you know, familiarity between these two teams, but I don't care that they know what's coming. They can't stop it. They're yeah. terrible against the rush. I don't know if there's anything in particular that Seattle does better than San Fran or, like, has better equipped on their team than San Fran does. You could say maybe, like, Geno's more of a veteran than Purdy is. Maybe you could argue the outside weapons in a sense. But, like, George Kittle, I didn't realize, had 11 fucking receiving touchdowns on the year. Yeah. No, he, he's been racking them up. Purdy, like, resurrected his career for sure. Yes. And um, also against Seattle, his last two games, four touchdowns against them. Granted, that was in Seattle. He weirdly plays way better in Seattle than he does at home. Obviously, this game's uh, in Santa Clara, but yeah. So we have a you got a rookie quarterback versus a first time playoff quarterback, and that that's like the only concern I would have if I was a San Francisco fan is like I, I think when you're young and you haven't been in the big moments, the bright lights, you know, they they might be burning through the skin a little bit. But like, has Geno been in that situation? I feel like you can make the case. Maybe he has, but then he. That's like, what I mean. Like, that's the only like kind of outside uh, noise that might actually affect the gameplay. Like it could go. What if Geno's like, man, uh, like this is my time to step up, and Brock Purdy gets nervous. Like there is that factor of it. Brock Purdy is just cool as a cucumber, though. I don't know. Cucumber's Kid does not get rattled. Stuff, dude. Um, let's talk about some prize picks squares until and and then we'll get into the our prediction of the game against the spread if you're betting on it, etc. All right, all right. Uh, now, Animal did put his bet. In before uh, he called out sick today, took one of his PTO days. It's quickly running out of those. 
Where do you put it? George Kittle, I put it into my section. Oh, okay. swiped them all. I see. George Kittle, more than 40 and a half receiving yards. These are up on prize picks. We will be making these for every single game. So if you are not a prize picks extraordinaire, make sure you go download the app. It'll be the first link in the description. Use promo code BDGE when you do so, and they will give you a 100% deposit match. So he took 40 and a half receiving yards. I think that's a smash line as well. Uh, Purdy and him have just had great connection. Last time they played against Seattle, Five targets, four catches, 93 yards, two touchdowns. I don't really see a world where he doesn't go over this. No, I mean, I don't either. I say this every week about George Kittle ever since Purdy's been in the lineup, and it seems like he finds a way to, like, have a good game but sometimes not hit this line. So I actually like his line of 10.5 fantasy points more because, obviously, he gets a touchdown. That's going to be a smash spot. And essentially, this is what happened to me last week where I took – uh, Kittle over, I think it was like 43 and a half yards against the Cardinals. Cardinals stink. The, the ki- I mean, they killed them too, and it was kind of like a meaningless game by the time they got up. So yeah, like, but it was like Kittle still had a good game. He found the end zone twice, yeah. but like it didn't it hit my line. And I'm like, what is this bullshit? Yeah, so I get Kittle's been up and down, but that's I feel like when you have a dude that's so athletic, that just like tends to happen, especially in these offenses where the production is kind of fluctuating. And now you add yeah. a dude like Elijah Mitchell into the mix, and then you have another weapon that you're like trying to get involved into the offense. So Kittle up and down, I kind of like the fantasy points because it's like you know he's going to get it, you just don't know where it's coming from. Yeah, full PPR and. And um, oh, also the weather. I don't know if we touched on the weather, but it's going to be it's going to be a wet one. So I think a lot of short passes from Purdy, uh, Kittle, obviously the you know tight end kind of around the line of scrimmage. That's going to help him more. So I like that aspect for Kittle too. Yeah, I mean it's in San Francisco. The weather is supposed to. It's like mid to high fifties, so no concern about like it being cold. But ninety percent chance of precipitation throughout the game. Winds between ten and fifty miles an hour. So I actually I heard it was going to be like like damn near monsoon. Really? Yeah, my mom actually lost power. Like our whole neighborhood lost power. Doesn't have Wi Fi for like the last two days. Really? Yeah. I mean that won't affect the future weather. You know? No. Past, well, past it past weather is not predictive. That's right. Of future but weather. I, I think we're going through something. Right past now. fantasy points not predictive of future fantasy Ca- points. Same thing with weather. California's going through a breakup. It's crying its eyes out right oh, now. Oh shit! Hopefully they get over. Hopefully it's they, down bad. They can find a, reba- a rebound tomorrow night before the fucking game starts. We will link. Uh, we use the Roto Grinders weather app. Um, it's a, a website, a link on their website that's really, really good, and it kind of tells you the concerns of this guy who's a weather expert that he has he has with future games. So we'll link that down below as well if you want to just go check it out at any point. So weather, yeah, a little bit of a concern, which is, you know, another thing with Brock Purdy. Uh, does he play well in, in bad weather? Has he had a bad weather game yet? Um, No, I guess not. It's only been – I mean, he played at Iowa State. So I'll tell you what. Iowa Gino, State's not all sunshine and rainbows. lives in the darkness, bro. He was born <laughs> he there. He was born there. Seattle, all they do is cry. All they do is rain in Seattle, man. I don't know. I don't know. The more I think about it, the more I, I think we might see an upset going mm, on here. No chance. I'm going to take Elijah Mitchell on prize picks. More than six fantasy points. We saw him get back into the lineup last week for the first time in a minute. Five for 55 on the ground. Gets the two touchdowns. I actually think Elijah Mitchell is going to be, uh, I don't want to say like a breakout player throughout the playoffs, but I think he's going to be a really key piece of their offense and like push them over the edge in games where they need C-Mac to have a break or they need another offensive playmaker where if like IU gets shut down or George Kittle gets shut down, Debo Samuel also should be a full participant going forward. He yeah. didn't play the last couple of weeks or whatever. He's um, going to be a menace. Right. So they, they'll be at full strength for the most part. No injuries that are significant, I believe, in the recent uh, week or so. Elijah Mitchell over six fantasy points. The dude has been so good, averaging 6.2 yards per carry this year. So, when he's, I mean, we know the story with him. Uh, it's like Mostert when he was on the field for the Niners. When he's on the field, he's going to do well. I do think he gets a goal line opportunity or two in this game. If he converts it, good for him. He could also break the big play. So, I think there's a lot of different ways in which he can get it. I think it's a, it's a small line. I expect 8 to 10 touches out of him in this one. I think he gets that pretty easily. Not sure how again, but I think I think he does hit it. Yeah, I mean, I think he gets there pretty much based on volume because of the weather. Like we said, I think everyone's running the ball. I think Debo gets carries. I wouldn't be surprised to see Ayuk or Ray Ray McLeod get end arounds this game. Like, it's just going to be running nonstop for the 49ers. Like, a Mitchell's going to get his carries and, and his work. I want to say, too, um, on, on the Mojo app, if you guys don't use the Mojo app, this is an app in which you're looking towards, like, the player's future and his career earnings right it's basically buying shares into a player and I think Elijah Mitchell might be one of the biggest winners on this app throughout the course of the playoffs because you're looking at guys who are going to play the most amount of games in the playoffs to keep increasing their score and I feel like Elijah Mitchell is one of those underrated dudes where the Niners will probably stay in the playoffs for a minute and that will keep increasing his price and his price has dropped so significantly because of C-Mac coming over but I think there's a chance that next year this is you know a committee and Elijah Mitchell's a 
big piece of this offense in the running back situation. So I think Elijah Mitchell's a dude that you get in early right now on Mojo and watch his price increase, you know, five, six, seven, eight percent over the next month or so. And this is, you know, an alternative investment app. So Elijah Mitchell, I feel like is a guy that you can get into um, and bring some money home. So if you don't use the Mojo app yet, you can go download it. It is now live on Android as well. Um, so iOS, Android, if you're in New Jersey, you can actually invest and play. If you're in any of the other states, you can just enjoy the app, look around, have some fun on there. So Elijah Mitchell, six fantasy points, Elijah Mitchell on Mojo. You're looking at the other back. I am. Christian McCaffrey, the main guy, the best weapon out there. Uh, I've been bouncing back and forth between his, his rushing line, his receiving line. I think I'm just going to middle it and say that my favorite square of Christian McCaffrey is 115 and a half rushing and receiving yards. going to go over there. Uh, his last matchup, last time he played Seattle, went for 138. And that was pretty quick. I mean, eventually Jordan Mason started to get his later in the game when the, when the score got out of hand. But, I mean... This is just a good matchup for most of the 49ers passing attacks. Seattle plays zone coverage at the second highest rate in the NFL. That's where McCaffrey, Debo, Kittle, that's where they all thrive. Uh, Seahawks also blitz at the third lowest rate in the NFL, which really helps Purdy. When Purdy is not under pressure, he's able to make those easy throws, those high, highly completable passes. So I think... Uh, McCaffrey, he had 26 rushing attempts last game. So if you're going to give him that same workload, I just don't see how he goes over his rushing prop. His receiving prop is probably great too. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I can't take all three at the same time. So I'm, just, I'm, I'm picking uh, rushing and receiving to be the best one I like for McCaffrey this week. Yeah, that's the anytime a number is like just raw number that high, I tend to like back off a little bit because it's just – like 115 yards. Yeah, know? no, it's ridiculous that I feel this good about 115 yards. Yeah, but like, it's not going to surprise me when he hits it, but I'm just like, I'm, I'm too much of a coward to actually get in on that. I, I do like the next line you had, though. Uh, For this, oh yeah, this same game. Okay, so there's, I've, I've been going back and forth on a lot of these lines, but I think the next best line that I like is for Kenneth Walker and Jawan Jennings to not score a touchdown. So prize picks offer squares where they combine two players and you basically bet the more or less of touchdowns. I mean, Juwan Jennings. I love that. He just like threw that. Yeah. Yeah. This is basically just betting on Kenneth Walker. Yeah. Like if Juwan Jennings finds the end zone, so be it. You know, he's going to score two touchdowns a year. Be kind Maybe of devastating. This is, that, that was like your fourth so square devastating. and that's yeah. how you fucking lost it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, Kenneth Walker had a tough game against the 49ers last time they matched up. Um, Niners, obviously one of the best run defenses in the NFL. Um, I think they do a really good job at kind of rattling Geno because Geno's resurrection this season has been through a lot of play action. And when you can't establish a run game, you know, the play action obviously doesn't work as well. 49ers also take a lot of time of possession. So you're, you're kind of limited on the plays that you have as an offense going up against the 49ers. Again, just all feeds into why I just think this is a horrible matchup for the Seahawks in general. But I, I don't think they're going to have a lot of opportunity to run the ball. And, um, yeah, I don't know. K Kenneth Walker isn't a guy that I'm necessarily scared is going to, like, break off a big play. I know he has that ability, but against this defense, uh, I, I worry about what he's going to be able to produce. I was going to fade Kenneth Walker this game going with, like, rushing yards. Price picks put mad respect on the 49ers having his line at like 60 and a half because he's he's damn near doubled that like every week for yeah. the past month. I mean, like, I like the touchdown line because one, he has zero receiving touchdowns on the year, right? He like, he hasn't got in through his legs through week uh, since week 12. And that's last week, he got 29 carries, the week before that, 23, the week before that, 26. I mean, that's an insane amount of opportunity. He He's having a hard time getting to the end zone, though. Yeah, and I think, like you said, a big part of that is the lack of receiving production. He's actually been on the field for passing plays at a pretty high rate ever since Travis Homer hit the IR. So I, I was also kind of looking at his over 10.5 receiving yards a little bit because, you know, just, like like just one screen. If they're playing really down do, from yeah. the, If they're playing down, I actually I think that's a good line too. Yeah, that was that was one I was mulling. I was also considering maybe like Geno Smith over 15.5 rush yards just because, like we said, a lot of passing plays – are probably in the books for the Seahawks, so maybe you got to scramble. He was pretty successful scrambling right, pick last your week. motherfucking square. Dude, this you can't is the be problem. like I like every. Fucking I, I like Come every on. fucking square on the board. I'm seeing this game so clearly. 
It's like it's not raining almost. Come on, you're not a geometry teacher out here. We gave you our squares. Let's do a game prediction. And whether you're taking the spread or fading the spread here. I'm going to lay the 9.5 with the Niners because I just don't think the Seahawks throw up that many points. I think if the Niners can score 21, there's a good chance they cover the spread. Okay. So give me the... Give me the Niners. I mean, I'm going to take the Niners in a straight-up win as well, but if I'm betting on the game, I'm taking the uh, Seahawks plus 9.5. It's just too many points, you know? this is I'm going with Why? the animal TCU method here. <laughs> it's a good team, just too many points. There's no way they can't stay within it. I don't know. I just feel like it might might turn into like a sloppy, low-scoring game, and I feel like there's a chance that Seattle just kind of stays within maybe a little backdoor Geno cover, you know? I think that's what you're hoping for at that point, though. You're like – you're. Bank it on a back door. Yeah, I mean, we're gambling over here. Fuck. I guess so. I, I, give a fuck. I think it's going to be low scoring because the Seahawks probably putting up like seven. That means the Niners will put up 16. There we go. We covered. Boom. All Chargers, right. Jaguars. One of the more exciting games on the slates for this entire weekend. This is probably the one I'm looking most forward to. Chargers at Jacksonville, minus two and a half points, 47 and a half over <laughs> under. This is the night game. Uh, this is Herbert's third career game versus the Jaguars and second versus Trevor Lawrence. They did play back week in week three. Jags killed them. Jags killed them. They they're, smoked them. They're different teams at this point, different injuries happening, different progression happening. The Jaguars have, I mean, they smoked them, but they've also gotten way better as a team as the years progressed. Justin Herbert and the offense are kind of clicking. I'm, I'm surprised they just so handedly got into the playoffs, but we're here. We have two really, really young, exciting quarterbacks going against each other. And I think the biggest injury concern here would be Mike Williams is likely going to miss his game. Didn't practice at all yesterday. Don't think we've had a practice report today. Yeah, I mean, it's it could all be downhill for the Chargers. Ever ever since you they decided to play Mike Williams in week 18, nothing but bad vibes coming from him. Joey Bosa also got dinged up, but I haven't heard anything serious about whether or not he might miss the game, so I'm not overly concerned about I, him as I think now. I think he has a good chance of playing. I don't think he misses this one. Yeah, weather no concern, uh mid 40s, wind 5 to 10 miles an hour, so that's not something we really got to worry about. But the Jaguars have to worry about Justin Herbert and the Chargers have to worry about Trevor Lawrence, the defense has picked up. They played, you know, one of their better games or the last few games have been some of their better games. And I think their defense is picking it up a little bit. So on that note, you know, Mike Williams out. I think this de- this offense for the Chargers is one that struggles when they don't have Williams and or Keenan Allen together yeah, on the field. Definitely. Um, we've seen a large sample size of that because Keenan Allen missed a bunch of games. Mike Williams missed four games this year as well. And we've seen when that happens, it's like you're, you're playing with a bunch of like Josh Palmers and and uh, DeAndre Carters and just a bunch of like average dudes. And Gerald Everett's been like up and down this year. I don't really look at him as a significant contributor to this team, at least at a, a consistent level, where I do with the other two guys are superstars, Allen and Mike Williams. So when I'm looking at the prize pick squares, I'm kind of going into this with the mindset that Mike Williams not playing. And we have a sample size of four games this year. And Austin Eckler has just gone fucking bananas in the receiving game when Mike Williams is not on the field. Four games. I mean, he averages six and a half targets when Mike Williams is on the field. Take him off the field, talking about ten and a half targets per game. You're looking at seven and a half receptions per game. Prize Picks has him at five catches right now. So I'm looking at that line. I'm hitting the more for sure because I think what happens is that offense gets a little bit stagnant, right? When they don't have the, when they don't have a possession receiver that he can go to. Obviously, Keenan Allen's a great player, but like eventually, you need a secondary option that always ends up turning into. Eckler. Anytime their offense gets stagnant, it, it turns the running game into the short dump off game. So five receptions for him without Mike Williams there is where I'm looking at the, when they play the Jaguars in week three, eight targets, eight catches. Uh, I mean, I, I imagine that's a little bit of how the offense is going to operate through Eckler, of course. Yeah, I mean, Jaguars are terrible against the pass and especially in that in the shorter yardage pass attempts where it seems like the Chargers, that's like what they want their offense to be. It seems like they kind of limit the downfield shots that they take with Herbert. I hate it. I hate it. I know. It doesn't make sense, but this might, you know, be a situation where this actually benefits them not taking shots downfield. I, I, wanna, I, want, I want Herbert, Mike Williams, Keenan Allen to play next year full strength and then get like a third explosive wide receiver. Like that would be fire. If they had another downfield like Yak guy, Combine Mike Williams, Keenan Allen, and put him as a wide receiver three on that field. Just like a better Josh Palmer. Yeah, like if Josh. Yeah, like I just, I just feel like Josh Palmer is a very so mid average mid wide receiver. Yeah, total mid shelf receiver. Yeah, and it's like if Mike Williams is off the field, they don't have 
a real field stretcher. Like Keenan Allen catches a bunch of balls, sure, but he's like a slot wide receiver. I just want to see them at fucking full strength. One time for me, Justin. One damn time. Yeah. Animal, for the record, his uh, square is Travis Etienne, more than 15 and a half receiving yards. If you want to go uh, look for an explanation from him, maybe he'll comment it down below. Maybe you can go tweet at him. I don't know. Uh, I won't I won't try to put words in his mouth because right now he's throwing up everything, so they'd probably come <laughs> out. All right, so I'm going to go with Travis Etienne to have more than 72 and a half rushing yards. Another line that's huge. Mm-hmm. It might be one of the biggest ones on the slate. I mean, we're actually... Now that I think about it, it's the same line that McCaffrey has against the Seahawks. But we look at this Chargers defense against the run, and they're just terrible. 29th in DVOA. They've allowed a 100-yard rusher in six out of their last eight games. Jacksonville isn't necessarily a great running team, but I I think they're just going to have to lean on the run game in this. I mean, both these teams want to throw the ball, but only one of these teams can really defend the pass, and that would be the Chargers, Jaguars, like I said, are, are terrible at that. So I think this is going to be a pretty big ETN game. Um, also, last time, week three, that uh, these teams faced off, James Robinson tore up the Chargers. I'm trying to find his line here. RIP. Yeah, I mean, he had a couple big runs, I think. I think he went over 100 yards. but He, he did have like a 50-yard 50 uh, yard touchdown run. ETN, but ETN struggled last week. Played against... Um, Tennessee's a much better rush defense yeah I mean this is going to be a massive step down in in competition but uh James Robinson 17 for 100 week three ETN also tacked on 13 for 45 himself on the ground so Chargers just been bleeding rushing yards to damn near everybody yeah I mean you look at I mean Tennessee obviously incredible run defense they were at full strength last weekend uh week before that nine for 108 against Houston 22 for 83 the week before that against New York 19 for 103 the week before that so like there's gonna be some recency bias that I think pushes you away from ETN just based on week 18 but if you look at the three weeks prior to that and he has these explosion games like in the middle of the season 10 for 86 14 for 114 24 for 156 28 for one they've never shied away from him is really the point here and it's a defense that you can absolutely eat up on the ground so I like uh I like try another one where the line feels like super high I probably won't touch it but like not gonna be surprised at all when he hits it yeah. Um, so, who do you think win this game? Because I keep going back and forth. I mean, at this point, the line's like basically a pick Uh, Yeah, 47.5 point over under. I got to go. I think I got to go with the Jags. Like I said before, it's just bad vibes coming out from the Chargers. And in my opinion, like the fact that you played your starters week 18 and now you don't have Mike Williams. I also think Doug Peterson's just going to coach feels weird Brandis that into feels circles. weird that Jag, the Jaguars are are home underdogs too. It's two and a half points. I know it's not a lot, but just it still says something. I feel like. Yeah, I mean, I, I, Chargers had the better record, so maybe yeah. people take that into consideration. I don't know, but it, it feels like both Peterson and uh, Brandon Staley are gamblers. But like Peterson is calculated, Staley's kind of reckless, and I just feel like Staley's going to do some ignorant bullshit and yeah. and coach Staley's him out of like this game. like a gambler who like goes to the roulette table and and puts a stack on green because he's just like I'm feeling it, yeah. I'm feeling green, <laughs> yeah. it's just like black fifteen or some shit. Uh, mm, I feel like my 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 heart says Chargers, my brain says the Jaguars. I I almost feel like it's a duel between the the QBs and and I love the turnaround that Jacksonville has made this year. I don't I don't know if they're there yet with I don't think they can win a playoff game yet. I think this is gonna be another learning experience from yeah. Trevor Lawrence and then next year is like when they really make a deep run to like the semis or whatever it is. But I'm uh I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna take the Chargers. I, I think if the Chargers were full strength at full health, I would feel immensely better about them. But yeah. I, I mean like on paper, they're in a position to succeed offensively and even limit the Jaguars a little bit, but at I think they just fucked up by playing week 18. Yeah. Um, that will be an interesting storyline for the entire offseason if they end up losing it based on... Does the, Staley it, get fired? Uh, wouldn't shock me whatsoever. I feel like people have been calling for his head for a long... Then again, like, everyone calls for everyone's head every time you, like, have a losing... Se- or you, like, God, They're in the fucking playoffs right now, and it, I could understand if he did get fired, but also I think a lot of that noise probably comes from Twitter about people just like, you know, if my player doesn't put up fancy points, every coach should just be fucking fired. Yeah. That kind of stuff. Um, but, like, how many seasons do you get with Herbert and not win a playoff game? That's fair. Um, 
I put, I put my money on him not getting fired. I think the players like him too much. I think they like yeah. the way that he actually plays aggressively and they'll play for him. I th- I, again, I think a lot of it goes back to like not having the offense at full strength. But they do have enough playmakers that it sh- that shouldn't really be the case. But I will say, uh, I'll say he keeps his job regardless of the outcome of this game. But he won't need it because the Chargers can win. I don't know. Kind of sketch. All right. Uh, well, that will wrap up this little two-game slate for Saturday. Uh, enjoy the games, and make sure you subscribe to the channel. We will have a video like this for tomorrow's games on Sunday, which is the Dolphins at the Bills, the Giants at the Vikings, the Ravens at the Bengals. So not actually not too much interesting uh, stuff going on in that we'll one. Just, we'll just skip that day. Yeah, yeah maybe, we'll, a bunch of maybe we'll be back Sunday for Monday's <laughs> games or whatever. Uh, but go hit prize picks. Promo code BDGE will get you a 100% deposit match. Go check out the Mojo app. If you are in New Jersey, you can go nail Elijah Mitchell and go nail Darius Tony before they play next week as well. He's my guy throughout the playoffs. I think he's going to shoot up the price. But uh, love you. Goodbye. Yellow butt. I can't believe I didn't start with that.